Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. We'll open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, from about the 9th verse. Of course, Paul is going through a thorn in the flesh, is buffeted because of the abundance of revelation. The Bible says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations that was given me a thorn in the flesh. The mind of God is revealed in humbling this individual to teach the church that you don't need to have thorns in the flesh because you are struggling with keeping yourself under the rule of the measure of the Spirit because there's a knowledge that puffs up. And in fact, the Greek word there for the knowledge which puffs up is gnosis, progressive knowledge. All right? Paul had his own woe with the things that were coming to him to reconcile just how much he knew and how much humility he had to have. And in the process, because it was so hard for him, he found himself getting puffed up. But the scriptures tell us what puffs up. It's gnosis, progressive knowledge. Not a pit gnosis, the complete and perfect will and purposes of God that designs both the things that are ethical and divine. So in the realm of gnosis, it is possible for a man to be puffed up. And here Paul is saying the abundance of revelation puffed him up and so a thorn was given him to buffet him lest he should be exalted above measure to remind him that he had a treasure in nothing vessel for the excellence of power to be of God. The New Testament has no excuse to say that people are sick because they are being buffeted by the devil. <laughs> you know why? Because we know better. We know better. We know better. Why Paul shares his experiences to tell us, do not exalt yourself above measure. Don't compare yourself with people, lest you become fools. There's a huge teaching in the scriptures that help us understand how we ought to walk. The Bible says that God is no author of confusion. There has to be an order in the house of God. And so we're instructed. And so you don't have any excuse to say, you know, I'm suffering this because God wants to humble me. No, God seeks to humble all through teaching. He instructs us the way of the Spirit. And the word there, flesh, is not just physical flesh. It could mean emotional. The word there is sarx, S-A-R-X, the Greek word. It's not necessarily physical sickness. Okay? It could be an emotional issue. It could be a psychological issue. For what we know, that Paul has taught us better. But anyway, we go to the ninth verse where I want to throw my emphasis from, which is not so much part of what I just shared earlier. And, of course, he besought the Lord thrice that this should be taken away. And God said unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect more in your weakness. God says his strength is made perfect more in your weakness. Most gladly, then Paul says, Therefore will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So you ask yourself, how does Paul glory in infirmities? Does he start feeling pain? He says, oh, I thank you, God, because I'm feeling pain, because I know. No, 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 it's more than just that. What does it mean to glory in infirmities? The mind of God, the ways of God are amazing. And the responsibility of the church, the fivefold, fourfold ministry, whatever you want to call it, the Bible says, perfects the saints for the work of the ministry to the edification of the body. Our responsibility is to give you maturity through the things that God will bestow in our spirits. And there is no definition in the ways of God that relates with the maturity of an individual if the mind of God is not revealed in any circumstance. We don't mature by seeing signs, miracles, and wonders. We mature by the understanding of how signs, miracles, and wonders work. 
It's not the charisma, it's the charismatos. It's not the gifting, it's the source of the gift. It's the knowing of how to stir this thing into manifestation. The Bible speaks of Jesus Christ and how the prophet Simeon holds him in his hands and prophetic words are spoken unto him as a child. And the Bible says, and as the things were spoken, the Bible says, many wondered, many were amazed at the words that were spoken. But the Bible says, but Mary kept these things in her heart. She pondered on these things. In other words, sometimes we can be so mesmerized, so taken by the wonder of the things that are spoken in the word, that we lose the revelation of the purpose of that word in our lives. Mary did not lose the revelation of the purpose of that word in her life. She pondered those things. She meditated. She took time to go contemplative in a generation where not many people are contemplative. Not many people see the things that must be seen in the entirety of those things, in the fullness of the things in which they must be seen. Yes, Paul says, we see in a glass in part, we prophesy in part, we behold in part, we understand in part, but he promises a fullness that should come. And when that fullness has come, the Bible says the parts are dealt away with. Is it a future experience of the parts being dealt away with? No, it's not a future experience of the parts being dealt away with. The part is dealt away with in the revelation of the person of God. Revelation is that element, is that entity, it's that substance, it's that grace, it's that glory that separates the man that receives in part and the man that gets these things in full. So when the Bible says of his fullness we have received grace upon grace, it's more than just the power and the anointing. That's generic authority. Generic authority is available to every believer. You can cast out devils, cleanse lepers, heal the sick, for lo, I'm with you till the end. He says these are the signs that shall follow believers. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You know, I'm not talking about just the working of the lame walk or opening the blind eye and the deaf ear. This is a wonderful glory, but that's a generic authority in the Christendom. Every believer at least ought to know how to walk in the Spirit in signs, miracles, and wonders. I'll beat that there are people who are given a bit more because of the intention of God concerning the assignment of their individual lives. This even goes beyond the authority of the gifting on a man. This is in the realm of the heart that has learned to seek God the right way. To seek God the right way. Because not every seeker finds. But scripture has told us how to seek God the right way. And whoever knows how to seek him, the Bible says, they surely find him. They surely find him. So God seeks to elevate his mind to you and I. He seeks to show you how he thinks the ways of the spirit. So you understand the judgments of God. Because when you do, or if you do, it means that you will not struggle with the things that many people struggle with. You will not waste time in many things. You will not lose a lot. You will not suffer much. God has taught us how to come out of anything. And I mean anything. I mean anything. You can come out of anything. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter how indescribable it is. It doesn't matter how overwhelming it is. You can come out of anything. But you just need to know the ways of the Spirit. And this is one of them. God brings a revelation to us, a very mighty revelation, where when Paul is going through pain, the Spirit of the Lord comes and tells him a very powerful revelation that the strength of God is made perfect in one's weakness. And when Paul got the revelation, the understanding of that statement, he learned to glory in his weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon him. So we want to understand the mind of God concerning why do we glory in our infirmities. Does it mean that we will come attacks and we entertain attacks and say, oh, you know, I thank God for the attack. Let the attacks come. No, no, that's not what the Bible is teaching. God is trying to tell us but if you study the way I work, I have a way of allowing, of entertaining, of placing you in places of weakness so that 
the enemy would be deceived and confused enough that he has the right to come and attack you. And only then will I reveal my power and glory and surprise your enemy. That's what he's trying to say. God has a way of studying you as his own and understanding that you will never know how he works, how he functions fully, until he places you in a place where you have no aid, you have no ability, you have no sufficiency, you have no efficiency, you have no potency of coming out of it, and he makes sure that he exposes the same thing to the enemy to make sure that the enemy can study you all of his angles. So you'll appear like you're left and forsaken only for God to work out a bigger victory for you. That's the way of the Spirit. So, do not be surprised sometimes when you're believing God for something and circumstances worsen. You probably are in a ministry and you believe God for a breakthrough of some sort. And then you come out of one situation and then you go into a worse situation. You're in a marriage issue and it was bad last week and you went for service, you prayed, and then the next week it even became worse. You had sickness in your body and then you prayed and fasted and did all these things and then you even developed ulcers on top of what you were suffering with. And sometimes you're like, I think God is not hearing me. I think God is not going to work. I think God is not for this. I think God is not in support of this. No, that's your mind telling you. I'm talking of a God who can even instruct you into the way that will appear weak for your enemy so he can allow your enemy to be provoked enough to attack you. And God sees the end he wants to get you such a glory. Such a glory. That your story will not end in your local area. It will not end in your community or your family. He wants to get you such a glory. That you shall be spoken of as a proverb. That you shall be spoken of as a testimony. That is the way of the Father. Some of you, you think God has forsaken you. No, he has not forsaken you. He's working out a far weightier glory than you can ever imagine for your life. He says that our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, they are but for a moment. He says they cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed, the eternal weight of glory. They cannot. Because the glory that should come or will come out of the things that are being tested or are testing you in this hour, the Bible says they shall not be compared to the far more exceeding eternal weight of glory that shall be revealed in your life. Hallelujah. I'll give you a couple of examples in Scripture. When God sends Moses to deliver the children of Israel from the hand of Pharaoh, we see a rebellious king, a stubborn man who refuses intently to release the children of Israel. Then finally, because of affliction and the attacks that come, the Bible says, finally Pharaoh tells Moses, take every Israelite out of Egypt. And so, they march on. Now, God shows us something powerful in Exodus, the 14th chapter from the first verse. When the children of Israel are coming out from the hand of Pharaoh and they're going to the promised land, they have to cross the sea. The Bible says, the Lord said to Moses, in the first verse, and I'll read in the Amplified Version. He says, the Lord said unto Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp before Tell them to turn back and camp before Pihahiroth. In other words, in the release of the children of God, there was a supposed way to the Red Sea. There was a supposed direction to the Red Sea. And God tells this man, Moses, he tells him, uh -uh, don't go in the supposed way. Don't go in the more calculatable way. Don't go in the safest way. Don't go in the most predictable way. Do not go in the most defined way. Because I'm the one who is leading you. Therefore, you think that that's the way you should go. No. He tells him, tell him 
to turn back and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Megiddo and the Red Sea, before Baal Zephon. And he says, and you shall encamp opposite it by the sea. And he says, for Pharaoh will say to his Israelites, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And the fourth verse says, and I will make or harden or make stubborn strong Pharaoh's heart, that he will pursue them and will gain honor and glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and the Egyptians shall know that I'm the Lord God. And so Pharaoh attacked, or so they did so. If you read that from the message version, from the first verse, God speaks to Moses and says, tell the Israelites to turn around and make the camp at Pihahiroth between Megiddo and the sea, camp on the shore of the sea opposite Baal Zephon. And he says, Pharaoh will think, listen, Pharaoh will think that the Israelites are lost. He says he will think that they are confused, that the wilderness has closed them in on them, and it will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn again, and he will chase after them. And I will use Pharaoh and his army, the message version says, to put my glory on display. Hallelujah. Now, listen to a divine instruction that is telling a man to turn the course from the way he should go, to go to a spot of witness so his enemy will see him as one who is entangled, so his enemy will see him as one who is lost, so his enemy will think that the man is confused, so it will stir the heart of Pharaoh to attack, because God needs to show his glory to the world. What a God. What a God. And oh yes, there are instructions that you will receive from God, and those instructions will appear like God is throwing you into trouble. The instructions you'll hear from God, and in doing them, you will feel that He's throwing you to points of weakness. The instructions you'll receive from the Father, and you will feel as though God is exposing you to more shame, to more distress, to more trouble. And this is one of them. It wasn't Moses' idea. The Bible says God told Moses, Yes, this guy has released you. But there's something on this story of 400 and more years of bondage that I cannot let go. I must define something. I must do something to the Egyptian that he will never think for a moment to come again and trouble my seed. And he says, you know what? Instead of going that way, go in that particular direction. Because when you do, Pharaoh knows, his people know, that the right way to the sea and the crossing should be this way because the way is a paved, the streets are straight. Go to that way so he will think that you are lost, so he will think that you are confused, so he will think that the wilderness has closed them in. Saints, there are things we do in God and the world starts to think that we are confused. There are decisions that you'll make as a believer and the world will think that you are lost. There are certain commitments that you will allow in your life and the world will think that you do not know what you're doing only because that is the thing that will start something in the devil to launch an attack that will reveal the glory of God on your life like you have never seen before. We would not have known of a God who patsies if Pharaoh had not attacked again. But that's the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And later we see when they cross through and they start going into certain kingdoms, kingdoms fear them. They say, uh-uh, we know what your God did to the Egyptian. God gave Israel a victory. But the whole world got to know that there is a God who can part seas and the children of Israel cross. And then the devil comes through with the sons of Egypt and he will sink them with their horses and their chariots and their strength and their armies and their potential. God has a way. He has a way of exalting himself above every circumstance of your life without your help. But sometimes the instructions of the Spirit seem like they're taking us to more exposure and destruction. I don't know why God works that way, but that's God. And he says, uh-uh, it's just my way that I love presenting you weak. So my strength will be made perfect in your weakness. What am I saying? That thing won't kill you. You won't sink. <laughs> no. That thing did not come to destroy you. Uh-uh. 
The weaker you become, the more expectation of God's power and glory concerning your life and story. It's just the way of the Spirit. That's just how God works. I imagine Pharaoh receiving a report from his men. And his men are telling him, you know, these guys are lost. Instead of taking the right way, which is obvious, they've gone the wrong way. They are confused. The wilderness has closed them in. They don't even know where to go. And I think Pharaoh would think, uh-huh, this is now my opportunity. God has a way of making the enemy think the way he has to think enough to get you glory. And that is why I feel sorry for believers who invest time in listening to their enemies. Except you're instructed by God. Because God has enough power to cause enough confusion in the interpretation of those things that are against you. So they can be convinced enough to think that they have a way with you. Only because he wants another show. There's something he wants to work in your life. There's something he wants to do in your life that will be written or spoken of for the rest of human existence, and it is possible for God to earn a certain glory for you that shall be spoken of for the rest of human history in the mighty name of Jesus. That's what happened with the Israelite. Go to the story of Gideon. Gideon is supposed to be fighting the Midianites in Judges, the seventh chapter. In the first verse, the Bible says in the Amplified Version that then Jerubal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose up early and encamped besides the spring of Harod, and the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. So they are camping not far from the people that they are supposed to be fighting with. Now, again, we hear God telling Gideon, the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hands. The people you have are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hands. Now remember, at that time, Gideon has about 32,000 men. And the Midianites have about 135,000 men. That is four men to one. And so, you're dealing with 135,000 men. You have only 32,000 men. And God appears to you, Gideon, and he tells you, uh -uh, these fellows are too many for me to give you victory over the Midianite, lest Israel should boast about themselves against God, saying their own hand has delivered them. Look at this God. No, no, no. Let me put it in your normal terms. The connections you have to the job you need are too many for me to give you victory, lest you say that it was your connections that got you that job. No, the business partners you have are so many and they are so well connected. I think I'm going to reduce them. I'm going to disconnect them from you. Least you say that your business was made because you had the right business partners and the right connections. <laughs> no. The ministries that are so connected, some of the men and ministers you know in the gospel, there are so many. And some of them I'm going to allow that they don't communicate with you anymore. That they don't call you when they must. Lest you boast and say that your ministry was built because you are connected to certain big ministries. Can you believe that our God thinks that way? And then tomorrow you see somebody leave you. Oh, I think I have a curse in my life. Tomorrow you see a business partner come out of your business. Oh, I think I have a demon in my family. It is following me. It also followed my grandfather. You start carrying the narrative of the old, of men who didn't even have relationships with God. And then you think that that is your story. Sometimes God will take things away from you because he wants to give you a victory. That no man or woman can boast and say that I am the one. If it was not for me, that guy wouldn't have made it. If it was not for me, that woman would not have broken through. God has a way of separating you, consecrating you, isolating you only to himself. Because he wants to reveal a victory and glory on your life that no man can claim hand over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so he said, no, no, no. These are too many. There are too many. Them. He says, ah, okay. How do we do that? 
Tell them, you know what? First tell those who are afraid to go. The scriptures tell us. He says, you know, if there's any man here who is afraid of 135,000 men because we are 32,000, go home now. The Bible says 22,000 walked back. 22,000. It's a little above 60% of them. They went back. The Bible says he remains with 10,000 who are bold. He says, uh-uh, these ones are still too many. I have a certain picture. Already, the median I is calculating that if this fellow has 32,000 and we are 135,000, hello, the victory is ours. And God reduces that number further. He says, uh-uh, take them to the waters. There are going to be two kinds of drinkings and separate them as of those that bow to the earth to drink and those that lap it up to drink with their palms, separate these and that. For me, what I want are 300 men. And it's amazing, and this is now for ministers, that if God should give you victory, you don't need every man around you. But the Bible says the king is not served by a multitude. When the kingly anointing settles on your life, you'll understand that the people that you need are not many. They're not many. And the wisdom for every priest is to know your 300. To know your 32,000 and your 300. To know the difference. Jesus had a different conversation with James, Peter, and John. Later, Paul in the book of Galatians calls them pillars. He says when James, Peter, and John, which seem to be the pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, to the uncircumcised, as it was to the circumcised, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcised. See, these were pillars. These are the men he would go with to tell them, you know, tarry here and pray. Yeah, they're weak men, they can sleep. But they have something on their lives that the Christ needs at the point and hour of his testation. If he should bleed in Gethsemane, there are certain men he needs not far from him. Not everybody was there. Not all the twelve was there. Not the five thousand that ate bread with him were there. No. So he says, you come to me because you want bread. You see? And how do you design them? Simple. How they drink. Again, God has given us the testation here in the story of Gideon. It's how they drink. It's how they drink. It's how they receive. Because remember, in the New Testament, we get to the space of the water. The cleansing of the water is the word of God. It's how they receive. Design those who receive a certain way. Not those who act to receive a certain way. This is not just a physical thing. No, for Gideon it was a physical thing. But for a man of the New Testament, the dispensation of the new birth, there's another way God has told us to design those who heed. That's why even when Paul is separating Timothy, he says, teach these things to faithful men. Give these things to faithful men. If there are certain levels of impartation, impart certain things to men which are faithful enough to teach these things to others also. He says, moreover, it is required in stewards that they be found faithful. So he's giving us the clue. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. He's telling Timothy, bequeath these things to faithful men which are able to teach others also. Hello, he's trying to tell us that the definition of the faithful is in the power of the steward, the man who knows how to be steward. So the Bible says you are stewards of the mysteries of God. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a keeper of sacred things? What does it mean to be a keeper of sacred things? How does a person handle the word? How does an individual relate with the word? How do they respond to the word? Because the Bible allows us to even prove ministers. It says that all these firstly must be proved. And sometimes it's the small instructions that we send, not because we need them to do certain things, but because you're testing this individual against the word that has been given them. And that's how you design your 300. That's how you separate your 300 from the 10,000 and from the 32,000 that are available for you. Because God builds ministry with a three. For Gideon, there were 300. When he came to the Christ, they became three. And he says, yes, the 12 are wonderful. They're all disciples of the Lamb. Thousands that are following, they eat with me, they drink with us. And that's wonderful. They are all acceptable in the Lord's beloved. But if I am looking for men 
to travail with as a certain people that I can't invite in certain spaces. Not because I don't love them, but because of how they drink, because of how they receive the word, because of how they relate with God. And to invite the 22,000 which walked away afraid into the spaces of the 300 is to have the worst defeat of your life. Because we have seen God hold back his hand to give victory to men because of fear. The Bible says it led them not through the way of the Philistine, even though it was shorter, seeing that they would fear the Philistine. And the Bible says, and then he took them the round way. So they spent 40 years of a journey that they could have spent 14 days for. Because God saw the spirit of fear functioning with them. You don't underestimate the spirit of fear amidst your own. And fear is diverse. It's not just disease or what. It's shame. They cannot stand on the streets to preach with you. Their friends will see them. They cannot associate with you when you're in trouble. They cannot sacrifice with you when God demands an offering. They cannot. They just need bread. So when they come to Jesus, oh, master, where have you been? He says, no, 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 no. You're not seeking me for eternal life. You're seeking me for the loaves of bread. And the Lord knows it. It's no offense. It's the truth. It's the truth. And as a man of God, you don't want to go pointing. That one is in the 5,000. This one is in the 12. No, 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 you don't do that. It's yours. It's between you and your God. Because you have a relationship with God, you have that confidentiality to keep it between you and your God. It's your responsibility. Because if you do that, it only means that you are frustrating the way of the Spirit. And that could come a very wrong way in your life one day. Anyway, back to the story. We see the children of Israel under Gideon reduced from 32,000 to 10,000 to 300. And when they're 300 and separated, God tells Gideon, this is all you need. This is all you need. And I want to do it in so such a way that it will be clear that it was not about the numbers that followed you. It was about the God that was in the midst of you. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit showed me a mystery. If you get 135,000 men and divide that with 300, you're talking about 450. Now, when you study the scriptures, 450 is actually a mark of the judgments of God. The number 450 is a number that defines the judgments of the Spirit to know how to design the judgments of God. That is why when you open the book of Acts, the 13th chapter, the 20th verse, the Bible says, and after that he gave them unto judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. So you see that the dispensation between the patriarchs and the kings are judges, and the judges exist in 450 years, and Gideon is among those judges. And so God is revealing the judgments, the knowledge of his judgments in the spirit. And when you get the 135,000 men and divide that by the 300, that's the 450. He's trying to show you that this is you designing my judgments. This is you designing my judgments. This is you understanding how I judge. Because you see, you know, tomorrow you see a reduction on your numbers as a pastor. You see your business partners cut out. And you judge God foolishly. You judge God foolishly. In fact, the mystery of that number in the biblical terms, 450, again, in that definition of the knowledge, is a thing that is defined in 2 Peter, where he says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. He knows how to redeem the godly. He knows how to deliver the godly. And he knows how to even preserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. He knows how to even wait for your enemy until the time when your enemy will be defeated at the right time and at the right cause, you must understand how God judges issues. He's a God who just loves showing his strength 
at your weakest points. Who ever knew that the biggest threat to Israel in the days of Saul, I was Goliath, the Philistine of God. The biggest threat of Saul was going to be defeated by a 17-year-old boy. Who ever knew? <laughs> that is the God of the Bible. That is the God you believed. Who ever knew that God would defend something? Oh, the threat is there. Uh, you know, when the Philistine stands up, he says, who among you? You know, call. Call among you the best men. Do whatever you want. Come and attack me. He even taunts Israel. And no man dares to come and attack him because he's a big fellow. And a 17-year-old walks to the king and tells him, you know what? Don't worry, I got this. Where was that boldness in that boy's heart? In fact, when you read 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, the 42nd verse, when Goliath saw David, the Bible says in the 42nd verse, when the Philistine looked about and saw David, the Bible says he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest unto me with staves? And the Philistine cast David with his God. Am I a dog that you come to me with a stick? Am I a dog? Do you think I'm a dog? He's more offended and he starts to curse a man under a certain covenant because he feels that not only has Israel belittled him, it has disrespected him to the nature of a dog. How can you send a little small 17-year-old? Am I a dog that you can beat with a stick? He curses David with his own gods. Because God wanted to show the Philistine that to deal with you, I don't need an army. I just need a 17-year-old boy with a relationship with me. And that is why when David is standing before Goliath, He's asking the question, who is you that defies the armies of God? He's asking, who are you? Uncircumcised, he calls him, uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of God. Because the issue of that victory is not based on the strength, it's not based on the guns, it's not based on the tankers, it's not based on the ballistic missiles, it's not based on nuclear weapons, it's not based on the atomic bombs you have, no. It's best on, are you circumcised or aren't you circumcised? Do you have a covenant with God or don't you? And David is asking, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That he should defy the armies of the living God. Five stones, the Bible calls them smooth, one only. Wah, 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 wah. God didn't even need to use the other four. Boom, and the guy was down. Hallelujah, glory to God. Because that's just the way of God. He loves getting you in a place where you appear so weak. So the devil will bring his greatest blow. And God will show him who you really are in him. God will show him what you're really made of. God will show him what is in you. Some of you, you are confused because you don't understand the judgments of the Spirit. You don't understand the judgments of the Spirit. You don't understand how God judges things. You don't understand how God judges issues. You think that because you're out of rent, God has left you. Huh. Oh, you think because you went to a doctor and you were given a bad report, you're to be judged. You don't understand. God can, through that very weakness, will through that very weakness, work out a glory on your life. This cannot define for every man, but for the man that knows I'm talking to you, I am talking to you. When your weakness is revealed, the Bible says his strength will be made perfect. Now you understand why Paul glories in infirmities. So when that man goes through testations, he's already clapping his hands saying, hmm, God, what are you going to do? What are you going to do this time? What surprise are you bringing up? How could you let me be chased out of this house? What surprise? What amazing thing? God is looking for people like that. His love people can get in the midst of the storm and they look to God and start asking questions of where are we going? What glory are you going to work for me? I know that it's far exceedingly greater than the thing that I'm suffering right now. Oh God, I'm so excited. And within that testation, you start to see somebody praising God. You start to see somebody lifting up their holy hands, praising God because they are fully pursued. Sweated. They know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's that point where things are so bad and you're at your happiest hour. 
That's why the Bible says, while we look not, he says, for our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, they are working us a far more exceeding weight of eternal glory. While, he says, while, while, that's the next line, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, they are temporal, but the things which are not seen, they are eternal. The things the doctor can see, the things the government can see, the things that the economy can see, he says they are temporal, they have an expired date. But he says, but the things which are not seen, he says, they are eternal. They are eternal. They are eternal. What do you see? What did you see when they chased you of that job? What did you see when you were fired? What did you see when your church failed? What did you see? What did you see when your marriage started shaking? What did you see? When they left you, what did you see? When they disconnected from you, what did you see? When they spoke evil about you, those that you love turned against you, what did you see? Did you see failure? Or did you see a weight of glory coming up for that? If you saw the weight of glory coming out of all of the most trying hours of your life, then that's a man who glories in his infirmity. The man that can see glory at the weakest point of your past. You are my hiding place. You always feel my heart is hot. Oh, to leave the rest. And I am not afraid. Cause I trust in you. Trust in you. Let the weak say, I am strong in the strength of the Lord. I will trust in. I want to decree this 
those words in your spirit that your eyes shift from your health that your eyes shift from your financial status that your eyes shift from the luck that your eyes shift from the pain that your eyes shift from the frustration that your eyes shift from the abandonment that your eyes shift from the rejection that your eyes shift from the weakness and that they might be placed on God because the Bible has promised while you look not every time you look back you frustrate the glory of God operating on your life this is how we glory in our infirmities and I speak upon whatever circumstance you're going through the judgments of God have been revealed concerning your story this morning. And I decree and I declare in the mighty name of Jesus that God has judged in favor for you. He has judged your family in favor for you. He has judged for your finances in favor for you. He has judged for your ministry in favor for you he has judged for your career your dreams your aspirations in favor for you i don't even care whether the landlord gave you a deadline i don't care whether you lost everything in a fire i don't care whether your house fell down and things are shattered i don't care how bad it is i'm speaking of a god who has reduced thirty-two thousand men to 300 to destroy one hundred and thirty-five thousand. I'm talking of a God who can get the threat of a big army, of an army, of the army of Israel. The strongest man known and is killed by a small boy and a stone, a slingshot. I'm talking of that God who has led the children of Israel in a direction that is least expected for the enemy to think that they are lost and confused, to be stirred to attack only because he wants to leave an indelible mark of victory that shall be spoken about. We're speaking about that victory in 2020. And that's how your life shall be. It shall not be otherwise. God is going to cause something out of your weakness. That his perfect strength through you will be a testimony that you'll never need to tell. But men will live to tell for generations to come. If you believe it, you shout amen. I speak for the sick right now. I speak healing. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, receive your healing. And that are bound, you're free. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an open invitation that you'll enjoy the life that we have in Jesus. It is free. He loves you unconditionally and he wants to welcome you into the kingdom. You just pray these words. You say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you shed your blood for me and was raised for my glory. You are the Son of God. And tonight, I confess your Lordship over my life. I'm born again. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.